We've previously looked at proto-Renaissances, and although historians of other subjects have revised the traditional idea of sudden change in the 1400s, art historians have never been in any doubt that a sustained and significant return to classicism can be seen in the lowlands and northern Italy. The Renaissance flourished in those areas primarily because of the economic conditions there, capable of sustaining scholarship and patronage of art. These areas represented the largest concentrations of population in Europe, largely owing to their access to northern European and eastern Mediterranean trade routes, respectively. Despite the limitations of a model which accounts for historical change in terms of a change in the economic base and resulting change in the cultural superstructure, it's fairly clear that the period represents a decline in the older feudal society, owing to a rise in the mercantile classes. With new patrons come demands for new types of art. This graphic represents with the mnemonic began the causes of the Renaissance. B, the Black Death, killed between a quarter and a third of the population of Europe, and the resulting limited supply of, and hence increased demand for, surviving craftsmen allowed them to organise themselves into guilds to represent their newfound prestige and independence. The session on medieval art looked at E, which stands for the earlier Carolingian, Ottonian and 12th century Renaissances. G, the Great Western Schism from 1378 to 1417, with the continuation of the Avignon Papacy but a rival second pope in Rome, was part of the decline of the feudal power of the church. We've also previously talked about the preservation of classical texts, particularly Aristotle in the Islamic world, and their reintroduction into Europe through Sicily and Spain. As a further impetus, Plato was reintroduced to Europe by classical scholars fleeing the Islamic invasion of Constantinople and translated from Greek to Latin by the Medici. Also new examples of classical sculpture and painting were unearthed by building projects throughout the period, such as low and high relief sarcophagi, or more famously and later the House of Nero and the Leo Cohen Sculpture Group. This work by Tommaso di Ser Giovanni, called Masaccio, represents one of the earliest works using a unified system of perspective. Orthogonals are the lines of straight edges, for example, of a building receding to the horizon and are represented in the diagram on the right. In classical works, the orthogonals receded but did not meet in one point. In Masaccio's work, they all meet in one point at the base of the cross. And there were various mathematical formulae for determining the position of regularly spaced lines running across the picture frame. In Masaccio's work, this can be seen in the gradual diminution of the intervals of the coffered ceiling as they recede. Often, the perspectival scheme will converge on Christ to represent his infinite nature, as in Da Vinci's Last Supper. In Masaccio's work, this is still true, but the infinite uh, vanishing point has been lowered to Christ's feet, so as to be at the eye level of the viewer and strengthen the illusionism of the work. Masaccio's Trinity includes a memento mori, or reminder of death, as a contrast with the eternal life of salvation. The tomb at the base of the work has an inscription which reads, That which you are now, I once was. That which I am now, you will become. Renaissance naturalism was aided in the north by the revival of classical oil paint, instead of egg tempera, an egg yolk based paint. As oil allowed for much greater detail, in this work in Ghent Cathedral by one of the earliest artists to use oil paint, Jan van Eyck, finishing the work started by his brother Hubert, the detail that we can see in the fabric enlarged on the right, along with the observation of the detail of God's hand, shows what can be achieved with the new technique. The fabric shows a pelican and grapevines, both a reference to the Eucharist, which is appropriate for an altarpiece in front of which mass would have been performed. The polyptic, an altarpiece with many wings, represents the theme of the adoration of the mystic lamb, which can be seen in the lower central panel. The top level's central triptych from left to right represents the Virgin, Christ and John the Baptist, with an angelic choir and Adam and Eve on the flanking panels. On the bottom row, the leftmost panel of the just judges 
is a post-war copy from a photograph, as the original panel was stolen in 1934. The just judges are the beginning of a procession of people coming to worship the mystic lamb, mentioned in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verse 29, Eke agnus dei qui tolit peccata mundi. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. To the right, ahead of them, in the procession, are the Knights of Christ, and in front of them, in the main panel, martyrs, saints and prophets. This work, known as the Arnolfini Portrait, also by Jan van Eyck, is in the National Gallery, London. We can observe in the floorboards, window and bed, receding orthogonals, but they do not in fact converge on one central vanishing point, as with Masaccio's Trinity. The use of oil paint has allowed a wealth of iconological detail, including a cherry tree, oranges, a mirror with scenes of the Passion of Christ in its frame, a conspicuous signature by the artist, a single lit candle, and a carving of St. Margaret on the bedpost. But what do all these details mean? Panofsky's famous analysis posited the idea that the work was a visual marriage contract and resulted in the work being called the Arnolfini Wedding. However, in 1997 it was proven that the work could not have represented the marriage of the subject identified by Panofsky. Rather, one of two different Arnolfinis were represented. The wife of one of them had already died, which would require a radical reinterpretation of the iconography. So, back to Italy and egg tempera. Vasari tells us that Paolo Uccello, the artist, was so obsessed with perspective, he would wake up his wife in the middle of the night to talk to her about it. In this work from the National Gallery London, he's arranged the lances and dead bodies in parallel on the field of the Battle of San Romano, so as to demonstrate orthogonals. The piece is one of a triptych, the other two works being in the Uffizi and the Louvre. In the battle between Florence and Siena, the condottiere, or mercenary general, Niccolò Tolentino, of the victorious Florence, is seen in the foreground. The historian Kenneth Clark saw in the scale of the architecture of the Pazzi Chapel as a reflection of the idea of the ancient Greek philosopher Protagoras, who saw man as the measure of all things. The pilasters, which are columns embedded in a wall using grey pietra serena and Corinthian capitals, are classical in origin, and Clark saw this as a profoundly humanist sacred space, with all elements of the earlier Italian Gothic removed. Although originally attributed to Brunelleschi, the architect of the Dome of Florence Cathedral, the involvement of other architects has been suggested. Lorenzo Ghiberti is inextricably linked to the emergence of the Renaissance in Florence. Although these doors, the gates of paradise, for the east of the baptistry of Florence Cathedral were completed in 1452, Ghiberti's involvement with the baptistry doors dates from 1401 with the commission of the north doors completed in 1424. The bronze panels are executed in relievo schiacciato, or flattened relief, and Ghiberti's genius of design lies in his mix of the drawn line, used in the background, with high relief sculpting of the protruding architecture and the figures in the foreground. Andrea Mantegna's perspectival ceiling fresco in the middle of the ceiling of the Camera degli Sposi, the Room of the Wives, in the Ducal Palace of the Gonzaga family in Mantua, is particularly interesting as an isolated example of a pure di sotto in su, or from down to up, perspective, whereby the perspective recedes vertically away from the viewer instead of towards the horizon. And this style of perspectival ceiling will become incredibly influential in the following two centuries. This triptych altarpiece, commissioned from the Flemish Hans Schmemling by the Welsh diplomat John Dunn, is a very useful way of exploring common attributes of altarpieces in the period. The Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 promoted transubstantiation and therefore the use of the altar, and consequently the use of altarpieces, in order to represent the Eucharist as the body of Christ. Accordingly, we see the Christ child on the lap of the Virgin here, there are saints with the patron's name, John the Baptist in the left wing, John the Evangelist with a poison chalice that failed to kill him on the right, with the poison represented by the worm above the chalice. 
Catherine of Alexandria is represented by the wheel in the distance behind her as she was martyred on a wheel. St. Barbara on the right by the tower she holds representing her place of imprisonment. In front of St. Catherine is the patron John Donne. And to the right of John the Baptist, ear peeping round a corner, is Hans Memling himself. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo and Raphael represent the three greatest Italian artists of the High Renaissance, each for their own individual developments. Leonardo da Vinci's earlier works developed the technique of using figures in a pyramidal formation to represent three-dimensional space. He used a sfumato, or smoked, technique, whereby the gradual gradation from light to shadow to represent flesh resembles the blurred edges of soot on the surface. He was a close observer of nature, differentiating plants and geological features. All of these techniques are represented in this altarpiece, the Madonna of the Rocks, in the National Gallery London, a replacement for the earlier rejected commission, now in the Louvre, which makes an interesting comparison. Nativities were sometimes portrayed in caves, owing to an ambiguity of translation from the Greek, and the Arundel Codex of Leonardo's notebooks describes Leonardo's mixed feelings of fear and curiosity when at the entrance to a cave in the mountains. And this parallels our relationship with the divine infinite. Is our finite nature engulfed in it? Or is the infinite awakened within us? The book of Revelations refers to the second coming of Christ after a time and half time, which many just before 1500 interpreted as signalling the impending apocalypse. This led to a radicalisation of religion, as with the fanatical preacher friar Savonarola, who exhorted the citizens of Florence to burn art in a bonfire of the vanities in the town square. It now appears that Sandro Botticelli fell under the sway of this friar, as evidenced by the text above the work and on the banderoles or scrolls of the angels which was recently discovered to have come from one of Savonarola's sermons. Also from the sermon come the embracing figures and vanquished demons at the bottom of the picture. <laughs>